So welcome to the Race Hunting Podcast, and I'm joined today by both Warren and Easton. Hey, and what's up, guys? Long we, time no see. Kinda. Been a week. Yep. So we got some cool stuff today that we're going to talk about. We'll get into that in a couple minutes, but before we do that, we need to do our our daily or weekly shout-outs. So what do you got, Warren? Who's Who's the lucky person that you're going to yak about today? Well, they're a winner. Okay, so we got oh, a winner. Oh, you already picked one? Well, I didn't. I put it into a put everybody's names into an automated deal on my phone, and then it picked it. So the winner is BBD ninety two seven eight one. It's a lot of numbers. BBD nine two seven eight one. Please report on the Apple. Office. Uh, you won the Knox, the very first Knox. So send it to us. Probably via email would be best. Send us your shipping address. Um, which email again? Contact. Contact at racetunning.com. So if you are BBD92781, then send us your um, shipping information to contact at racetunning.com, and we are going to send you out Well, the first ever Race s- Hunting Light of Knox, baby. Send us your address, your name, your phone number, and what arrows you shoot. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, we need to know your arrow so we know which size to send. That's a good point. Rare. Okay. BBD is going to get me shooting them before I even get to shoot them. Well, that's just because you haven't put them on your arrows yet. I know. Been busy. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be the first one ever. Uh, Nick Knott, he is, oh, he missed a reliable. It says, great conversation as always. Love the entertainment to get me through the work day. Uh, I think we did that one last week. Then all of our YouTube dudes, we got all kinds of YouTube guys. Uh, Jake Dully says, great podcast as always. Jacob Yoder says, awesome podcast. Jeremy Rupsick said, best wacky fact yet, Warren. New nickname for Warren is Wombat Warren. I love that. (laughs) I wish. I think that that should be, I should be put on a pedestal if I could do what a Wombat does. Yo, Wombat. What you doing over there? If you see a stack of brown things on my porch, you know what that means. I'm marking my territory. Stacking your turds. <laughs> That's what That's they're weird. doing. Warren's Bucky next downer. invention is going to be a template that you can poop in your toilet and it cuts out your cubes. No, for that's you. what makes the wombats so skilled is they, they don't, don't need, need it. it. Like, how do you do that? I I know the questions everybody is thinking, and I have the same one. I don't know if I. What's have their butthole shaped like? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we asked that. <laughs> There's no yeah, way it could be one. round. It's got to be a square. All you right. think? Uh, Bill McDowell says we all have goals to be successful. You have to work hard to obtain it. What about uh, user MW90T8VH8X? Holy moly! You should shorten that, my friend. He says, "What about a topic on planting food plots? We will do one of those um, soon." Joey Joey said he might be part wombat. Why does I'd, Joey think he's part wombat? Well, he must think that he Let's can see, poop cubes. Poop cubes huh? <laughs> <laughs> that is not my friend. Um, That's unfortunate. Google doesn't really have any pictures of a wombat's butthole on here. Dustin, Wal- <laughs> Dustin, <laughs> Dustin Waldron said that's what she said to the beginning of that one. <laughs> that one too. So, Do not egg right. these guys on. It's Justin that said that. Oh, and then Bam Bam twenty five thirty three. I gotta mention that he said shout out to the unofficial sponsor of this video, Pib Extra. <laughs> I was drinking it. Oh, and you didn't. Now they're gonna drop us. Well, they'll get over it. Hey, Pepsi I did, would probably be a better. Fit. I ordered everybody's pictures last week just so you get just to keep you guys in the loop, you know. So you guys' pictures are gonna be here pretty soon. Uh, you guys keep sending photos in and stuff, you know. But these guys are getting their special pedestal, so. Yeah, uh, we should probably get those up pretty quick. Well, I can't really help the printing service. When are we getting uh, this fancy sign? That is Warren. That is all Warren. Well, now I'm going to order it because I talked to Nick, and he said he, he thought it was outside of his element, and so then I told him I'm not trying to wait on him anymore, so I'm going to order one. And we'll just So it's just however long. You want to know what's funny about ship. that? Is I already told Warren that he couldn't go to Nick because Nick couldn't do it. And then Nick, he texted Nick. I got gotcha. you. called him. But all right. So you're just okay. procrastinating. So okay, here we so, go. All right. So today what we're, we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite subjects. We're going to talk turkeys because it's about we're almost there. And we've had several people that have written in or just commented in different. So lots of different questions. So not any really specific uh, 
turkey subject other than what are you guys doing to get ready right now? Um, I think we're going to talk pretty specifically about the different things we're like setting up as far as bows, yeah. like what what equipment and stuff that we have. Yeah, or do, guns or whatever else you're going to be using. Absolutely, and then we'll talk a little bit about some tactics as well. Um, but maybe we'll save um, actual some scenarios for another podcast. We we'll see. We'll see how much time we got. See how it goes. So anyhow, for those of you, and then we're just assuming that most of you guys guys are in our same kind of boat as far as April's really when turkey season starts. Um, March is kind of when this goes out. It's going to be March. Um, March is when we start getting ready, though. Um, and that means, I don't know about you guys, whether you're doing it or not. We do it, we or I do it. Um, but I run trail cameras for turkeys specifically. So that's one of the very first things that we've started is I start maneuvering cameras, m pushing them to different spots. Um, and so some of those are uh, field edges, things like that, places that I kind of know where turkeys are going to be. Um, sometimes I just take and gamble a little bit and see if I can find them in the timber. Um, but like the other day I got, or I guess it was two days ago, we got turkeys showing up in some spots, so that's good. You saw three toms yesterday. Yep. So that's the first time we've seen turkeys in that field, and that's usually when that's kind of a telltale sign that they're coming back. Um, I, I guess it would be interesting to know how many of you guys are dealing with, um, do your turkeys leave? Because ours do. Ours winter somewhere else. What do you? Do? What farms, though? Oh, at my house. Those They don't stay there. Oh, that's I fair. Thought I thought those birds they, were there all the time. Mm -mm. The two that the two farms that I was hunting this year, they never go anywhere. The one was freaking we, every morning deer hunting. We were hitting gobbles. The uh, that one was annoying as crap though, because we don't we haven't killed a bird on that. And oh, I guess we killed a bird there last year, but it wasn't easy. The ones at your house leave. They leave. I that's fair. I will say I don't see them. Like down there in the, the camp field and stuff. I don't. Yeah, they're every not time there I've been the out there, I haven't when seen it's winter, them. Winter, winter, they're gone. Really? I don't know where they go. I don't know if they, they must head to a neighbor that has easier food to get to. I wonder who that'd be. <laughs> well, That's huh. interesting. I didn't think that those, I didn't, I didn't even, think those turkeys left. Yeah, I didn't even think of that because the other, like I'm, like I said, the other farms that I'm around, they are there. Yeah. They don't move. Yeah, I would be very curious for you guys on if your turkeys, see how many places, how many people are hunting turkeys on spots that they're not there all the time. Well, the other place I'm thinking of um, where there's usually a bunch of, of turkeys, I would be curious I would be curious this year to see if um, – are they only in that one spot or are we just – we don't – we ignore the rest of the farm because there's so many usually in the one spot, like gobble or not. I, no, I know that they're in other places because I've hunted them in other spots. I, not, I haven't killed one. I haven't given them a lot of time, but I've heard them like across on the neighbor's um, right when you go in the gate there. Yeah. I've heard them in there. I've heard them um, where Alyssa found uh, the big shed the, yeah. um, back in there sometimes. Do you think that those are birds that have broke up from mm -hmm. um, Gobbler, though? Or do I you think, think so. that it's different birds? No, I think they kind of scatter a little bit. See, it I seems mean, to me like there's just one pretty large flock on that place that splits out. Well, I think Marty's ruined those birds. I don't think so. <laughs> I do, because they don't ever act right. We have a friend that um, this place was just money, and dad took him up there, and he shot. Three different times. Shot at three of them, and then he finally he, killed one, I think, yeah, didn't he? No. Just shot at three of them. Just shot at three different groups. So he shot at, like, 12. <laughs> you know, there was a lot exactly, of birds. Exactly, yeah. And then, so but, you don't remember last year when we were hunting them, and, like, oh, as they soon as they see a decoy, they're just. It's, yeah, they're just I have a, I do have a theory on that. That that is not from what? a one day uh -uh. situation three years ago. My my no, issue but. with where what I was running into there last year was that you had already hunted it. That's that why could be. that is why my no, they I did the not. exact same thing to me right away. That's what I'm saying. It was weird That's because my it was point. They were fresh and they didn't do anything. They didn't do what they were supposed to. They were acted like they knew something was up. Maybe well, once so. I did the opposite of what Warren had already done. We killed a bird there, and I could have shot two or three if I, I didn't have a tag. You used a shotgun. Uh, my bow could have shot him. That's my point is I did the opposite of what Warren did, and I could have shot multiple. Well, you used a shotgun. I could have shot them with my bow is my point. They just stood there. 
had no idea what was going on. One of the things that you got to keep in mind that you got to remember that, so just so you guys know, kind of almost every farm that we hunt, um, kind of the same boat that we are as far as turkey season, I mean, as far as deer season, and that is none of our farms are big enough that we're going to just hold those turkeys there. Someone else is going to have the opportunity to hunt them. They're going to wander to a neighbor's. And in the particular farm that Warren's talking about, that they seem like they had been pressured already, and they could have been. They could have been during youth season. Mm-hmm. You know, we just because we didn't hunt it doesn't mean that someone else wasn't. Um, so someone could have been in there during youth season. So I don't know. Um, I, I don't know other states. I mean, I know some of the other states. All the states that I've lived in have some sort of youth season. And in Iowa does, it's usually a week before. Um, so what are you hoping for by putting cameras out early? What it, and then how do you know that those birds are going to be there when, when the season rolls around? Well, fortunately, I've been doing it for years now on these same farms. So I kind of have an idea. I'm hoping to see, number one, I'm trying to get an inventory. Our, how many toms? Because we just discussed in another one of our podcasts, if you missed it, where would all the turkeys go? We don't have the same numbers that we had, say, 10 years ago. We had more turkeys then for sure. Now, I have a farm this year that I'm seeing a lot of turkeys on, and I don't know if it's just a good hatch, that um, a bunch of jakes that made it, but a lot of toms there. But it's th- that same farm had zero last year. We didn't kill a turkey, never. I know you hunted it one day. Did, you never heard a bird gobble, did you? Yeah, a few. There was, there was birds did, but there that just wasn't. They weren't. Not like it was before. Because really, yeah. I hunted it one day and never heard a thing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> I would say I feel like our numbers are pretty well the same. As they've pretty much always been. I, and if, honestly, if anything, I think they're a little bit better, especially where, Com- like at your place. Well, compared to two or three years ago, yes. Yeah. You think? I think our numbers might be up slightly from three or four years ago, but not from when we first originally moved into the house there. We had a lot of birds, which, I, and I guess I can't say that yet because just like what we're talking about, guys, is it's still early. We're still waiting on some of our turkeys to show back up. Our birds go somewhere and roost somewhere else, feed somewhere else during the winter. We've been pretty daggone fortunate this winter. We only had really two weeks of weather, but it was two weeks of some really, really bad weather. I don't think that – I have not found a single dead turkey in all my shed hunting. Um, found some dead deer, but – and then – Do you um, usually find them? If, if it's a really bad winter, you can. I don't think I've ever found a dead in Montana. I did somewhere where I didn't think it was like bobcat or something. No, in Montana, we I did find some. What, just it just their head got, froze got or cold. what? The whole bird was laying there. I mean, the feathers were all destroyed and everything, but you could tell when there's three or four of them, like in an area, then it's not a coyote. You know what I'm saying? Right. Doesn't kill. Uh, they'd kill one. They wouldn't kill four. But, I remember yeah. in Nebraska, the biggest seemed like the biggest problem for them was that train. You remember that? Oh, yeah. You probably don't. When we first hunted Nebraska, there used to be unbelievable amounts Amounts of turkeys. turkeys. And we went to this one guy's place, and he had, what, 600 or something? He had wintered 800 was what he showed us the picture of. Because he said, you don't believe me, do you? Which we hadn't said that. And then he was like, I'll show you a picture. Right. And it was, it looked like ravens just, just. Just well, he told freaking. us we could hunt, but he said there's no birds left here. And we're looking at 200 turkeys out in the field. Right. And he's like, they're all gone. And but then, like, the train tracks went right there. And I'll bet you there was 10 turkeys, just one down here, one down there, where they'd gotten smoked by a train. What ding-dongs? <laughs> Get off the tracks. Well, the tracks are thawed. That, yeah. And, man. you know, and so and then there's a little bit of gravel and grain, and so they were feeding on that. They were doing whatever they could to make it. That's fair. So... But anyhow, so right now, inventory and, you know, seeing what's going on, what we have out there. The other thing is, um, thankfully, Easton has taken up the, he's our hired hand now as our predator guy. So if you see that you're, what, you didn't know that? No, I just think that that's a really bad hire. Yeah, well. (laughs) That's why we pay per predator, right? (laughs) Well, I haven't been paid yet. (laughs) (laughs) But anyhow, one of the things you'll see is whether you got a lot of predators in that area, you know, and stuff like that. So you can see whether you got coyotes, whether you got bobcats, or a combination of both. That could be affecting what's going on. So, but getting your trail cameras out early, um, I'm looking for birds that are showing up at like consistently. What the heck? Krista, 
That's not Christo, is it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, There's Dan's that. Right oh, Dan's right there. Continue. Continue. All right. Well, um, but what I'm looking for is to find consistent patterns, like birds showing up every morning or birds showing up in the evening that would tell me that they're roosting there or roosting close by. Um, you know, and, and then the other one is just sheer, am I seeing toms? You know, are there some birds there to hunt? Do you think that that is necessary in order to, um, to be able to get on birds right away or do you more do it for fun or do you think that they're not going to be gobbling or something or is there a combination combination of both um and the reason wow you just knocked my water over you're flipping moron that hurt <laughs> um a combination of of all the above i think because one year two two years three years ago eli and i went to a farm that i a new farm and I didn't know whether there was birds there or not and did not hear a single gobble, not one. And so instead of leaving that, and it was cold and windy that day, I don't know if you remember, but that opening day yeah, was I remember. Like, it was like, and I went and got pancakes. Yeah, it was like yeah. in the 20s and the wind was blowing. So we went and sat on top of a hill because I didn't run trail cameras down there. So I had no idea whether there was a, I, I assumed it looked like good turkey country, but really didn't know. And we didn't get there till like midday, one o'clock, something like that. So we didn't hear anything, didn't see anything, but the weather I was hoping was what the problem was. And we sat there till like three or four o'clock and we were getting ready to leave. And I happened to glass and sure enough saw a turkey and I was like, hey, that's a tom. And they were just wandering through the timber. And so we came back the next morning. We came back the next morning to, to this day, maybe one of the most gobbling situations I've ever ran into in Iowa, ever. But I mean, they, it warmed up, right? It warmed up. It was a nicer day. But my point is, had we left an hour earlier, I would have assumed there's no birds there. Had I been running trail cameras down there, I probably would have been able to confirm that there were some turkeys there, which would have given me some confidence to come in that next morning going, there's turkeys here. So um, it, it, it can definitely have somewhat of an effect on what you do or how much effort you put in, um, especially if you're hunting public ground where you don't, you know, you're the other thing can tell you is, are there people, other people hunting there? You, if you start seeing pictures of other people, um, you know, trying to beat someone to, I mean, basically it's a race because they do gobble so you can hear them, but they don't gobble all the time. I mean, especially if the weather's crappy or things like that, or they're being pressured, they could be quiet. Last year was the first year I ever scouted, and I will never not do it again for running cameras. And that, and the only reason I say that, I only ran like three, three or four, literally just to see or just to try to get some photos of uh, one turkeys to see maybe where they were coming in or like hanging out consistently. And number two, to see if I could find where any of them were consistently strutting. And I did, I had found, I had gotten some pictures of some that were, they were coming by in the mornings, but they weren't hanging out there. So I just kind of tracked them like I would a deer, like trying to backtrack a deer to see where he's coming from and just found like a little spot that was like oh that looks like they would strut around there and I put a camera up there and they would strut there every single morning and so I found that and then that that one camera is what gave it gave me and Joey three shots in a day and I guess I mean two sits based on just that info and now I don't go sit on the camera or anything I'll go sit I mean unless it's a perfect situation but that all that does is tells me where I know they want to be or like to be at and then I've been able to, I get up, go in the morning and you just, I just wait for them to, or I try to get them to gobble or something. And then I'll set up from there. But that gets me a starting point. For sure. Versus just saying, oh, hey, here's a farm. Let's try to see if I can hear a bird somewhere here or there. However, it that there's something to be said for walking into a place blind, you know, and hitting a call and getting a gobble back. You know, I mean, there's something to say. I mean, it's fun, but you definitely stack some things in your favor when you have intel when like yeah. they're coming to strut there every morning i mean that that tells me okay this is a place that i'll sit on these birds and wait on them you know for a while i'm I'm really interested to see we have one particular farm that we're going to be hunting this year that um there's quite a few turkeys in there this year so i'm hoping that they stay there they just moved cows into there so i want to see if if it changes because the last card pull that i did i would say Five out of the last six days, they've been there between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. Been strutting around in this little opening in the timber. So we'll see if they continue to do that or if the cows mess them up. 
Yeah. I wouldn't think cows would do anything because they, they should be used to them down there. And don't they usually, they'll peck in their. Yeah. In their, where if they f- are feeding the cows, you know, like if they're rolling hay out for them and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, that can help. Um, um, so I think part of the reason we should talk about that though, is our goal. We've learned in the first week here is we're trying to kill these birds in the very first fast. Week. Yeah. Cause they get educated quick. Yeah. And they get really, really hard to kill. That That's the other reason why I scout because I turkey season for whatever reason seems like the season that I'm taking a lot of other people versus like deer hunting. So I like to do my scouting and I, if I do my scouting right, then I can get them done quick. And then I know that those are the easier birds to hunt, to hunt and get opportunities for. And then after that, I know that I've got time and I can try to, uh, those are the times like when I go somewhere where I don't have any idea and I'm, can just get up in the morning, hear a gobble or right. go somewhere where they might be more pressured or something. But that first week trying to get other people out of the way is why I scout as much as I do. Normally it pays off. Yeah. Yeah. So what, go ahead. Uh, just, they suck after, as soon as they get educated, the Eastern suck. Yeah. Me and, me and dad went through it last year. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but Alyssa's bird was on the last, what? Yeah, last I mean, couple days of the season. Yeah, it was. It was the last week at least. Yeah, but I think I I feel as though that bird was either fired up enough that he wasn't con- thinking about it, or we just got lucky and found one that hadn't been no, he'd I'm, been messed with. One hundred percent had been messed with. How do you know? By me and Dad. Yeah, we had hunted. Yeah, but had he we, come in or anything and seen the decoys? We had and every stuff? single bird that was on that piece had visualized us somewhere somehow at some point in the last two or three weeks. Hmm. But the but the the three that came in that she shot the one out of were the three we were trying to find when we went and hunted that other farm, and we never yeah. did find them. They didn't show up. I, yeah. Well, he happened to drive the fence line that yeah. day, remember? Mm-hmm. And so I think he pushed them over where they were. But, yeah. I mean, everything was against her and I that morning. The wind was blowing hard. Uh, it's late in the season. They've been pressured. They People been hunting them. So, I mean, you really had and, – and we weren't setting up a no, new spot. We went to a – so I don't want to jump the gun because I was going to talk a little bit about that. Um and and that is we'll have we will have some spots that we will strategic strategically assume from scouting that the birds are going to be there and I'll drop a blind in there and have it ready f- before the season. Yeah. And then we'll keep another blind and and for those of you that wonder, we use double bowl blinds. We've used all kinds of blinds, but the double bowl blinds are the ones that last. As much as we're especially turkey season, I am popping those suckers up sometimes five or six, seven times a day. Just depends on where, you know, go and set up, doesn't work, go set up, doesn't work. I think they're the easiest ones to set up, too, even though they're bigger than some. Absolutely. I just posted a video with Kyle down in Alabama, and I don't know what kind of janky crap that thing was, but he was trying to learn how to pop open, pop a, blind. open a blind, and I got it, but it was like, ugh, this is... The super this flimsy the ones are actually that's, way more difficult. That's yeah. what it, it was really flimsy. I Which like, the, I can't get it to hold anything. The double bull ones though, too. At first, you gotta you gotta open them a couple times because they're really tight at, and leave this, them open the for a week or something. <laughs> yeah. So if you can open them up, open them up first, and then leave it popped up for a little bit, and then do it a couple times, and they break in pretty quick. Yep. Um, yeah. The flimsy ones are impossible to get open because everything everything freaking goes everywhere <laughs> you had one i think it finally uh it finally hit, hit kicked the bucket that was so faded like it was almost not even any camo because you had used it so many freaking times and that thing would basically pop itself up yeah <laughs> if you had it in your hands but it also didn't blend in for anything because <laughs> it was just kind of a green <laughs> color yeah we got a fly in here yeah. we need to kill this fly which for turkeys though too, I think you should talk about. You're setting those up early just so that it's ready. We don't believe really that you have to correct um, stay in that exact spot or or, or brush it in for oh, turkeys. Yeah. That they're not going to get um, right. We're not doing it because they need about. to get ready. They need to get used to it. I'm doing it because I it saves us time if I've got three or four spots that I know on uh, maybe one on each farm, and we hunt several different farms, but I know a place where. We could keep the one on our back and say, okay, if we get here in the morning and they're doing something different or they're gobbling over here, we can go after them. But other than that, we can head right where we want to go and be ready. A lot of, t- lot of times last year would be included in that is 
I'll do my final scouting the evening before. I'm on a ridge top somewhere trying to glass, and I set that turkey, I mean set that turkey, set that blind up for those turkeys that evening. Especially when you're getting close to the roost. I think that makes a big difference, too, because then you're not having to worry about making too much noise, right. getting in in the morning and being right underneath them, and you can get close to it without, and then just pop your decoys up and get in. I don't think it's a very uh, common one, but for the new hunters or the new guys that are getting into turkeys this year, can you set up a blind the day of, the minute of, wide open, not in the wide open, you try to stay against field edges you in the cent if you got to set up in the center of a field are you avoiding it trying to find a different spot are you going in there or what you can set it up the moment you hear one gobble wherever you, you be, want you can set it up wherever you want however you need the middle of a field middle of a field not brushed in nothing you can just pop it up and typically they won't the only time and we see that here is that birds that have been pressured and been have gotten used to it that he was with a buddy when his buddy got shot outside of one of those square things, they will get leery of them and then they'll start skirting them. They'll still come to a certain distance, but they won't come right to it. Yep. You know, um, and typically, so then they, a lot of times when I say they'll come to it, they don't come within bow range. They might come within shotgun range. Um, See that, I agree a hundred percent on that, except for last year, that bird made, oh my gosh, that bird made zero sense. The Joey shot. Because I've never been able to, besides Bushy Beard, which is a beard that Dad and him go way back. <laughs> He's no longer alive. But uh, that was the only bird that we knew. Like, hey, that's that's Bushy Beard. Right. The rest, I mean, they all look relatively the same. Or that's one of the really long beards. When you have when your beard is wider than my hand, yeah. and it's over twelve inches long, that where he got his name, Bushy Beard. <laughs> well, he uh, we the first shot that he had that Joey had last year was, I mean, it was on a really pretty Tom, but I didn't think anything of it. He shot it. And then, uh, the next day he didn't hit it. Well, and it was fine. We looked for it and looked for it. But then the next day or next morning he shot a bird and smoked it. And I was like, why does that bird was completely alone? I, and it was not very far from the first shot. And I was like, for whatever reason, we should go back and look and see if this is the same bird. Cause he has one white tail feather, like one chunk of it. That's, that's white. Right. Sure enough, he'd shot that bird the day before, and he was just alone. He, and now he came in alone. Joey shot him, and he didn't even think twice about the same setup that he had just gotten freaking whacked at. But the, the second time, did he come in alone, though? The second time is when he came in alone. The first time, he came in with uh, another Tom. Okay. However, but keep in mind, make sure people understand, you guys were hunting with a bow. Yes, it was with a bow. He didn't so hit it. He hit he, it low. There's no big boom, you know, when you yeah. didn't roll a turkey in front of him or anything like that or didn't see you guys come out of the blind or just nothing like that. So he didn't know what happened that day when you guys shot or whatever. Um, well, I think, too, we should talk about, too, that we're talking mostly about Easterns here. Easterns Eastern, in Iowa. Because Eastern I, yeah. I would, a little different. In my opinion, the Miriams, you can treat quite a bit different. Yeah. Like, I think one of the biggest differences is I feel like here if we have a – group of two or three toms come into a set of decoys and you shoot one of those toms you've jacked getting, up getting, the other couple yeah trying to kill one of those birds again is going to be tough really really hard um at least having them come into decoys and stuff where i remember multiple times with miriam's that we would go and just change the decoys up a little bit and that afternoon we'd kill his buddy you know it was like that is why you carry as many <clears throat> pot tags in your pocket as possible I screwed that up last That's year. That's what I loved about We could have cleaned it out. We could have cleaned the toms out, and nobody would have had any idea. And we could there was other toms that were did not come in. But instead, I only had, we only had the two tags, and we shot two, and the other one was like, what in the world is going on here? <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our setups. Because yeah. we all, we all, all of us are bow hunting, but you talked about you might drag out the shotgun. Mm -hmm. um, and we all use a little different. <laughs> setups as well i think yeah kind of so as far as a uh, bow goes i don't change anything for turkeys i keep the exact same setup that i hunt with for white-tailed deer for elk for turkeys um other than i typically do change broadheads that's the only thing is i'm trying to and and i wish i had maybe i wish i'd brought one even though it's a podcast i know some people are watching um i will listening are, well but some are watching yeah but so you, they could see it uh -huh. What I'm getting at. I know at. what you meant. <laughs> I'm saying I know that not too many people can see. I'll I'm try to describe it. Right. 
Um, what mm-hmm. I like a rear expanding broadhead with three blades. That's as wide opening as I can get. And when I'm talking a rear expanding broadhead, I'm talking about not a rage style slip Which cam is a broadhead. Slip cam, yeah. Right. I'm talking about something that folds from the front to the back. And the reason is because I am typically shooting, well, I was shooting 70 pounds. Now I shoot 60. Um, but at 60 pounds, I'm shooting a setup that my arrows are like 410. So I'm right around that. Um, I want to say three, I mean, 285 to 300, somewhere in that neighborhood of what speed wise. You think you're 285 to 300? You're yeah, like 260 was, what, or 270. Because I remember I dropped size of arrows. What arrows are you shooting? 400s. Oh, yeah, but still, you're going to be like 260s, 270s. Oh, it might yeah, be now. it's like probably 270s. It might, it might be. I don't know that you're I... You're 290 at 60 pounds. I mean, you're I can't even get to 290, and I've got the longest dry length. I know, well... But, but I'm also yeah. shooting he- freaking logs. Right. Yeah, in comparison. Regardless, well, though. So, so, my, so my point is, is that I don't change the setup. Because the other thing is, we're not shooting... I'm not shooting very far at turkeys. You're definitely not with the setup that you went to last year with your no. bow. Um, but so we're looking at 20 yards and under typically. Well, and so explain why you're, other than just a big cut, why you use those reverse opening broadheads or from the front to the back, however you want to explain it. Because what I'm looking for is that arrow to penetrate, but I don't want it to slice through that turkey like you want to for a white-tailed deer. I'm not looking for two exit. I'm not looking for an entry and an exit hole. I'm looking for an entry and it hopefully go all the way through, but hang up in the turkey, stay there. Because that's one more thing that he's got to contend with to try to get away. But this is also because of the location in which you Where shoot shooter, birds. Right. Yep. Which I'm is not, different than most. Yes. Because we, I shoot my birds in somewhere that we call the shiny spot, which is on the wing of a turkey. Actually, that thing is outside. I should grab, grab that. Um, is on the wing, the copper part of the wing. I aim at the front corner of that. And I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to break both legs and both wings. If I can do that, that turkey cannot get away. Yep. It's impossible. If, and, and I'm going to say this, and I, I know it sounds crazy. If you break both legs, a turkey can't fly. I know that doesn't sound like it makes much sense. But if you break both of his legs, he can't fly. And what I mean by that is they are big. It takes them a little bit to get up off the ground. And if their legs aren't underneath them, they can't get off the ground. Um, I I know that this isn't a broadhead discussion discussion as far as on the podcast, but this is a pretty good case study, which I don't know how we've never thought about this before. Um, As far as when we're when we're shooting so we're shooting the exact same setup so we shoot at deer and then we go and we put these reverse opening broadheads on them and it it cuts down so much penetration that 80% of the time how often do you think we're getting a pass through on turkeys with those broadheads i would say that it's less than 10% yeah, I would say 10, 15%, I don't know, like 10 maybe. to 15%, something like that. Okay, and then the few times that we've ever shot them with any other kind of broadhead, a fixed blade or a um, slip cam broadhead or anything else, always a clean pass-through. No problems. So if you're concerned about penetration on animals with, a rever- with, a, with your broadhead, I would not recommend any kind of broadhead that reverse, reverse opens, opens. Which And I've seen tests on YouTube – and the problem with a lot of their tests is they'll shoot like a like a piece of plywood, right? And then and those ones always win on the plywood. Well, what you got to keep in mind there is the reason that it's winning is because it's basically a field point by the time it's getting through the plywood. So then it's opened on the other side and there's nothing for it to keep going through. Or when it's in the cavity of an animal, you got a lot of you have a lot of friction to try to flip that thing all the way open when it's inside of an animal. You lose a lot of kinetic energy right there or momentum or whatever the term is opposed to it just having to slide open and being and cutting immediately. So I know that that's not the discussion, but it is, I don't know how we'd never thought about that before. when we've had some of those discussions, uh, that's pretty interesting because we're intentionally doing that for the, the penetration purpose. Right. Yeah. We, and, and this, the other thing about this one too, is we don't, uh, the broadhead that we were shooting there for a long time was not like a name brand, was it a name brand? Yeah. The Hammerhead. Yeah. The Hammerhead, Hammerhead was, was one, and then Rocket made one. What about one. the one, though, that you ordered on, like, freaking Amazon that was, like, a hundred of them? It was, but it was, uh, it was just a, a Hammerhead. A hammerhead. Oh, okay. Well, we, my point is that it's not like we're buying, like, your expensive, spendy broadheads here. 
nor am I. I'm. I want it to spin good when it's on. Absolutely. Like when I when I put it on my air, I want it to spin well. But I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, it needs to be shooting freaking perfect at 40, 50, 60 yards, all this stuff of being super intricate. I'm not shooting over 10 or 15 yards nine times out of 10. So as long as it's going to get to there, I'm good. Because those same broadheads, I would never shoot on a deer or or, or an elk or whatever else. Um, but And they're not inexpensive. So anything rear expanding. The only ones that I will say that I wouldn't recommend for turkeys is – which I'm going to try them again this year, is those NAP, uh, what are the main ones you guys are using, the three blades that were rear-expanding? Like Spitfires? Or, is that I think the they were Spitfires yeah. or Triple X. Yeah, yeah. That, the Triple X one, because yeah. I shot that at one of my birds thinking that that would be similar. Right. And it's probably a testament for them. That one did not slow down, like at all. But any other rear-expanding ones I've had, they hang up in it. Yeah. So if which it's going to matter too if you hit them in the drumsticks or not. Yeah, well, I, right I in mean, the drumstick. I, I've shot them in the same spots I've shot my other ones, but so this is we'll just cover Warren up. Okay, <laughs> so that side is the side that doesn't I have anything it. drawn on it. Yeah, and then this I and figured you'd want the other side. Yeah, to, we'll we'll start here. So what I when I talk about the shiny spot, I'm referring to this which is this copper band, and it's big. So you're not looking at the entire thing. What I'm looking for is the bottom corner of it and in this picture is not perfect because you can't really i can see, see one feet. leg but if you yeah. can you'll be able to see their legs follow their legs up until it meets the wing when and and it changes if he's not at exactly a broadside angle like he is here or full strut or, or full or strut or but as but it, when they're in full strut and you can find that leg you come up that leg till you hit that wing and what i'm trying to do like now flip it around easton so this way I'm shooting underneath the heart and the lungs that are up here because what I'm trying to do is make sure that this bird does not get away. And I, and, and I, this came to me by accident. I shot low one day, and next thing I know, I've found the turkey because he couldn't go anywhere. I mean, The other thing about this, too, is those, like those vitals are pretty extensively high on this, this diagram. Because yep. otherwise, when we shoot some of these, the amount that do die right away, there's no way that we're shooting them down here. And on this diagram, it says that the, the lungs and everything are way up here when they die. Well, like within it's seconds. really vascular in there. There's lots of other things that, because you're going through, especially if they're in a full strut, you're actually going through the body cavity as well. So you're going through the lungs, I mean, through the drumsticks, you're going through the wings, and you're going through part of the body. And so when you have all three of those things, a lot of times these birds don't go anywhere. The, the great thing is, and I believe this, and if you guys are out there listening, I would bet you that if you've turkey hunted with a bow and arrow for any length of time, you've lost a turkey, even when you hit it well. I've seen people shoot them right in the heart and lungs, and they still lose the turkey. They killed the turkey, but they couldn't find it because just like a chicken that you cut their head off, they'll live sometimes for 15, 20 seconds Remember, they can fly, and if they pitch somewhere and they fly, they may not even land on the ground. They may be in the top of a tree or somewhere like that. So I started this uh, several years ago where I started shooting their legs out from underneath them. And then I just started fine-tuning where I was aiming at and what I was doing, and it led to what we call the shiny spot. And I'm shooting them in the shiny spot on purpose. So when you see us, you'll see lots of videos that we put out there and show people where we're killing turkeys. A lot of times we're, it looks like we're shooting low, and we're shooting low on purpose because we're trying to cut their legs out from underneath them. And for anybody that questions whether or not that's an ethical shot, I would tell you that more times than not, when I hit that right, they're, they run over, if they run anywhere, and flop around and die like within yep. 10, 15 seconds, and they're done. Now, I've seen some where they don't die right away, but at the same time, that's if I hit them, and they're, if they're still standing and I hit them, I'm launching arrows. Right. It is time to send the cavalry. <laughs> and mm-hmm. like last year was a perfect example. I absolutely smoked him. But that freaking, uh, I was shooting my three blade rages and that's what I shoot on everything. And I knew not to do it for turkeys because I knew it was just going to zip through. Well, I about took the freaking tactic cam out behind it because it zipped through the, the turkey so fast. And he had no idea what was going on. Because it went through him so fast, and he started walking away, and then I shot him again, and while he, because he still had no idea what was going on, so I shot him again. But I went over there, and it, I hit him exactly where I was trying to, where right. I normally would. It would normally kill him right there, but the arrow wasn't hung up. That's a very large key 
to getting them to getting that shot to work properly. I think it's important that people note that the goal is not to maim the turkeys. That's not the goal. It is it is trying to decide between a lesser of two evils. And that's really you is, have a yeah. perfect shot where it zips through them. Turkeys don't have much blood in them, right? And then even if the blood they do have in them, they have a ton it. of feathers, and so you're not going to get it's. Very rarely do you get a good blood trail on turkeys. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen because we've seen we've had it happen pretty good times. blood trails on turkeys, but it's very rare. So the problem is, is if you zip them, zip through them, and they've managed to pitch or whatever, and they make it a minute and a half before they, they die, how far can, ways. or even long running, ways. how far can a turkey go in a minute and a half? And now you have to just go and scour. Um, looking for a Looking for turkey. it. So you can either make a, an absolutely perfect shot and still not, and still have a 15% chance, 10% chance, or whatever it may be of not recovering that bird. Um, or you can have a shot that may not technically be, you know, right in the vitals, but you're going to have the opportunity. They cannot go anywhere. You they're are right absolutely there. 100% going to find them right there if you hit them where you're supposed to. And then, two, you can then shoot them again if you need to, wring the their neck, neck, whatever you need to do. Um, and so, to me, I think that it's, more ethical to know that you're going to be able to recover an animal um, than to know you're going to kill it and not recover it. Yes. Even though it, the it's, I can see where it's kind of like, well, you're intentionally shooting them to injure them. And that's somewhat true. But it is really not, though. I agree. I'm just saying I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate, yeah. as people have noted that I do, just so that saying that we're looking at both perspectives and we still believe that it's more ethical to be shooting them um, where it takes out their legs and they, then you can kill them quickly because you still should be able to, to do all that in under a minute. Well, that you could if it go, doesn't if it doesn't kill cool. them right away on their own. You could go we go uh, take a clip out. This could be a social media one, uh, a clip from shooting that bird last year because by the time I shot him to the time I shot him the second time was. Yeah, I would say under thirty seconds. Oh, and I can and think of. Over and died. I can I can think of several too. Several too where it's hit them right there where we want to, and and within thirty seconds they're dead. Yeah. Right. So. Well, I, well like I said, I'm just I'm too. about recovering turkeys. The, but the third option is when we got into it last year, very hard about the third option, and I've come around on it some. It still sits with me weird, and the more I think about it, it makes no sense because with a shotgun I'm doing it, uh, which does make sense with a shotgun but is shooting him in the head and i think that like after warren put his freaking 17 inch cutting diameter (laughs) blades on his arrow that's slight exaggeration but just a little bit not much um but anyways he shot that in the head and he drops right there that i feel odd putting my pin on a freaking head of a turkey or just any animal in general but if you think about it you're missing or you're not you're missing or you're killing basically and if, and I mean, I would, unless you hit low or, or like really, really screw something up. As well, far we've, as, we've got video of some bouncing off of a turkey's head. Oh, with a regular broadhead. With a regular broadhead. And so that, yeah, I think do we Do not should, shoot turkeys with a regular broadhead in the head. We've yes. learned that. Especially face on. Yeah. What about in like the, the, the waddles? Uh, that I've seen a lot of people that have killed turkeys that way. I mean. Yeah, you better it, it, make sure you hit him right in the waddles, though. We yeah. figured that you know, you'd left shoot him right. in the head with a any broadhead, a turkey, yeah. it was going to kill it. That is not true. Unfortunately, we found that out. And Even if you're shooting him in the neck with any broadhead? Yeah, if you hit him right, then, but you still got to hit him center of the neck because you got to think even you're trying to a break mechanical. I mean, you're talking, yeah. well, that in, if you hit him right in the front of it, it's just it, it hardly him. even has time to open. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And then I don't even know if there's enough. It's such a it might not even, soft material yeah. that I don't even know if it's enough there to open the broadhead. Right. Like, if you were going to do it, you'd probably be better off with you, a small fixed blade than you are a mechanical. You, or you got to make sure you center punch it well, right through the center. Yes, which, because that's how we unfortunately learned that, is I shot one, he was, like, looking right at us, and I put it, like, right on his waddles, and it hit him square right in the freaking, <laughs> right, in the right between the eyes. And, and it bounced off. Glanced off of him, and cut his part of his beak and that turkey survived didn't you have that happen too i cut one's beak clean clean, clean off. off and he lived what the heck? cut not the whole beak just part of one the top or the bottom i can't remember which it was now but there see that's another thing that drives their me. heads are about it. hard hard yeah. that's why if that's why if you're going to do it 
we so we after we setup. did we learned that we're like no never again now, will we ever do that because that is unethical. Well, yeah. unless you're in, unless you have a broadhead like what you shot last year that is intended to shoot them in the head. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, where then, there's then you then the headshot becomes a it's lethal. Oh, absolutely! You could hit them there with that thing in any place on the head, and they're going to die one hundred percent. But what? Um, it, well, what was it? Do you remember which brand you were shooting? Or yeah, it was a Magnus Bullhead, and which, it's four and a half or four inch. No, cut? it's like three inches. I think there was right. two two different cuts. Which, um, so I can just I'll talk to that a little bit. I if I could if I could hit them where you guys do, I would still be doing that because it was a total pain to go to a. Um, so one, I had to, I shot your bow and cause dad has a bow that's down to like 60 pounds. Cause those things, if you have them, um, if you're shooting 70 pounds, the way they're so big that it's plain, you're yeah, you, they, they plane super bad. And so you getting them accurate is very difficult. Um, you need a super stiff arrow. And so then, so one, I had to, in order, and then getting them to be accurate at all is super hard. So I had, and it's expensive. I went through $100 in broadheads just to get make sure that they were hitting where they need to because you can't shoot them at a regular target. You got to shoot them at a pillow. And so I had to draw them on a pillow and then figure all this out on the setup. So I saw I, his drawing, I too. remember that. I walk outside <laughs> in the shop, and I'm like, why is there a pillow with a kid's drawing of a turkey head on our oh, it was bad. archery target? And then I look over, and Warren's like, i got to shoot this with these new broadheads. I'm like, you're shooting a freaking pillow? Sure enough. Because yeah. it breaks the blades otherwise. Yeah. And so the thing I learned was, like, getting them to shoot past, if I had to shoot past 12, was, I'd be really nervous about it. I knew 10 and in, I could, I got it to where it was every single time I was going to be well in the neck. But past 10, like 15, I'd get sometimes where it was hit exactly where it was supposed to, and then other times where it was a little left or a little right. Like, there was still enough that it right. should be okay. But I had, so I had to change I had to shorten the draw length because I didn't want to go cut new arrows. Right. Because in order to do that, you have to cut new arrows because otherwise it goes unless into your you riser. Yeah. yeah, unless your arrows are past your riser. And I don't want to have to cut new arrows just for turkeys. Um, and then you have to shoot a really stiff shaft. I had to. I was shooting a draw length that was too short for me because I was trying to slow it down. And then the other thing is, is you have to keep make sure that you're – I had to move – I had to refletch some arrows – because the blades are so big that they were almost hitting the sight housing. And then on top of that, they don't fit in your quiver. So you got to put them. So I, Alyssa had me some little nurse box thing. And so I put them all in that box. I remember you screwing it on when we yeah, got you gotta get you in the blind, blind and screw out. them on. Yeah. And so, but for me, it was so much easier to just aim at his I head. didn't have to worry about anything else, but aiming at his, at right at the, base of his waddles and squeeze um so i think if i might go back to the shiny spot but i'm going to make myself do it with a back tension we should work on that because we are the same ones that we've all sat here one of our large issues when it comes to things like fixed blades at least i'll speak on it i think warren would probably attest to it i think you would too but i won't speak for them is when it comes to a fixed blade i like to have my uh when i'm shooting my bow I want my bow to shoot as is. I want it to shoot good. I want to be able to step out and shoot. I don't want to have to get into deer season or elk season or whatever animal season is coming up and have to switch something, meaning I have to go put my my fixed blades on or something and make sure I'm still shooting accurately or I know for a fact they're going to shoot well, but I need to move my sight um, and flip-flop back and forth. and all. Kind, I, I don't like moving things. When it's there, it's there. With my mechanicals, I can do that. This is a contradictory version of that, considering this is like a 10 times version of what you would have to do for a regular fixed blade. But the reason Warren does it is because he struggles like he's talking. So anybody that has listened for any amount of time will know this, but anybody that doesn't, this is why Warren is doing that, because he has a very, 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 very hard time hitting his birds correctly, which makes zero sense whatsoever. But... Turkeys get my goat. I think they make it makes a little sense. I think we should talk about that a little bit because one of the things that I've seen people in the past, friends of ours, and even I thought, I won't, I, I would not tell someone to start with a turkey with a bow and arrow. 
you're way better off starting Thanks, with. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate that. Well, you guys started because <laughs> you guys were doing it with me, and it was the first thing you were allowed to hunt. Yeah. But my point is, is that it can be a lot of chaos going on the way we hunt them. When you got a decoy set up, and I used to set them at six yards, I've now started setting my decoys out closer to eight to ten because they were coming in so close that it was difficult to get the right angle out of the blind. Sometimes they were passing between the blind and the decoys, and we couldn't shoot them. And so anyhow, because so that you guys know, wherever you put those decoys, especially if you're using a Tom decoy, that is where your shot is going to be nine times out of ten. He's going to be standing on it, next to it, on left or the right. But And when they come in, like on the one you shot in the head last year, he never sat. You were at full draw for a while trying to wait on him. And it, my point is, is that trying to pick the shiny spot out, if you haven't had a lot of practice – there's a lot of movement going on. They come in, they're trying to like thump on this decoy or they're trying to get in, but once in a while one will come in that just struts in nice and slow. And they do that sometimes, but there's a whole lot of times when they don't do that. So be careful if you're new to hunting, new to bow hunting. Turkeys, it's not something you probably should think, oh, I'll go out and start with a turkey before I go deer hunting. You probably should do that the other way. You should probably kill a few deer before you try turkey hunting with a bow and arrow. Because they they can be tough, or you might be better off. I think my problem is big game. I think that, like for instance, I can remember um, BG this year when I shot BG. He was quarter to me, pretty good bit, but he was at like six yards, and I could see in my head it was like X ray vision. I could see where his shoulder was, and I was like, I know that I can put it as far in front of his as far in front on the, sh- before I hit shoulder bone. And I know that I can hit that spot cause he's six yards <laughs> right. that I'm good. And I could see that in my head and I didn't have to think about it. And so then I was able to shoot him and he went 20 yards and tipped over. And then like a, an, I could have a deer, elk, antelope, anything at full draw and he could turn on me and I don't have to think about it. And I just know, Oh, okay. And I'm going a little bit further back or whatever the instance is. And I shoot where with turkeys, I do the same thing. Easton says that. He'll watch the video of me. He's like, well, the problem is you're shooting it like a deer. And I think that it just takes over for me. Like, I can't – I think it's it helps me shoot big game animals. And then on turkeys, it really works against me because I just – whatever feels like it's, like, behind the shoulder or something is just where my – it instinctively goes and, and my process – Oh, I goes think, through. I would say that I think that in a lot of the turkeys that you have not killed, you hit where you were aiming at. Yeah. It's not about shooting. Warren's hitting where he's aiming at, but you were aiming mm. in the wrong spot. On, right. You on, know, on, on, on most. There's, mm. there's been some arrows launched. <laughs> One time, and it was almost 10 years ago now, probably. That was almost. That was still almost the last time Easton ever was in a blind, <laughs> because Easton was the innocent bystander that about got his crap rocks because there was the first person to punch. So well, it was like, I think that was the third or fourth turkey that year that I. No, missed. it was not. How do you know, Nick? He says fourth. <laughs> I I said it in the the interview after that. I t- I say how many times you'd missed, but it was the how many you'd missed in a row, not necessarily from that year because you had missed a couple at the end of the previous year. Well, it was the same year I shot that one turkey two... Three times. Three times. Was yeah. it three oh, yeah, times and then, and then killed him with a shotgun? Yes. Or was it two times and then killed think, him with a shotgun? I think you shot him twice with a bow and then killed him with a shotgun. I have that, yeah. in, I have that in my photo. Those are all on different days, by the way. And it says... Uh, Shot three times with his bow, and then me and you went and killed it with a shotgun. However, so I don't know that was one too. was the beginning of my plague. Your plague? Yeah, because if you remember, I actually squared that bird. The first time, right? Right. So I used right to shoot him right in the wing butt. I mean, right in the wing butt. For me, it was, I think it was more like a shoulder of a deer, mm-hmm. and I just it was easier for me to aim at. And so East and I were hunting, and he was at 30 yards, and I felt, but he, and he wouldn't come any closer. He's a chicken bird, right? And I was... But he was just sitting there, and I felt really confident with it. And I was like, I'll put it right in his wing butt. And I, and I did. I hit him right in the center of that wing butt. But the problem was is we were shooting, at that time, it was like victory arrows or something. It was a VAP. Was, yeah. And they had the outserts. Yeah, it was the first, it was some of the first outserts, I think. And it broke. So when it hit the wing butt. 
No penetration. It broke, yeah, and so it didn't penetrate at all. And that, I think, got in my head from that point on. And so then we managed to somehow call him in again, and I hit him in the in the breast. That's how we knew it was the same bird is because when we bre- breasted him, he had this huge in. cut through him. And then I can't remember when the third miss was or third hit. Maybe it was the time I missed him with you. Yeah. And then East and I go and, and reaped him, and I killed him with a shotgun. <laughs> That poor that bird. That poor bird was he was freaking targeted. Although that's his own <laughs> fault. If you have that much danger in one area, you leave. Goodness gracious, how many arrows need to go through you before you decide, hey, I'm gonna go find another tree to roost in? Maybe he just, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing this. He All felt right, invincible so. by that time. <laughs> Let's talk a little. We've covered the bow hunting part of it, and that's because we really do a lot of bow hunting. But we should talk a little bit about shotguns um, and the setups for because I mean it's changed quite a bit since when I first started hunting them. Uh, the new thing now is seems to be these four tens with this titanium uh, TSS. TSS. Um, these guys are taking kids and they're shooting turkeys at fifty yards. Um, you, you could. We should bring them, or we should do it sometime. You set your your turkey gun that is freaking historical. It that, looks I cannot historical. believe the thing actually sits. Actually, it did fall apart. It freaking fell like, apart, and we put it back together because yeah, it was not. It, it was together. not put. It did not fall apart, as in like the stock comes off, the barrel comes off, kind of thing. Parts came out of that thing, and we put it back together, and it's still killing birds like left and right. But then you could take mine that is set up. Very similarly to like what you're you're talking like your modern, your different choke, a different type of shell through it, whatever else, and look at the old school versus new school. Right, I'll take the old gonna, school. Oh, I like it, <laughs> but know? that's what I mimicked mine off of. Is My, how much the, I like the gun your that, single shot. Well, the gun that you're referring to is a, a Harrington and Richards single shot twenty gauge, um, and nothing it, on it. Nothing on it. It's wooden stock. No um, choke or even anything. No, I mean, it doesn't and, even have a threaded and barrel. Number fives. You yeah. got to make sure that you're shooting, and it does shoot three inch magnums. So yes, you shoot a three inch magnum number five. Nick, would you say it works? I think that's what you killed your turkey with. Two for two with that one. Warren and has Warren. made some impressive shots with that one. Yeah. Well, the one was on accident. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, what the long one? Yes. Okay, that that one was fair. That it He's, was not on. He purposely shot, but it yes. was not intentional. It's not on like the gun went the off distance. and killed the no. turkey. <laughs> Neither of us no. knew that how far the turkey was. We East and I were reaping this bird, and it was. I'm. He stood behind me a little bit and filmed, and so then I'm just crawling up on him, and then there was a big ditch in front of us, and so the bird was at the ditch, and right. so I knew he couldn't get. Come he was across. not going to fly over it. At least I didn't think he would. And but I thought he, I thought he was like thirty-five yards or something like that. And so I shot him, and he, you know, flops over and no big deal. And then Easton's like, "Oh my god, that was so far!" And then I stood yeah, up I'm and looking was, from behind him, I'm like, did, I was like, "Oh dang, we're not getting a shot." And so I just let the camera was. I was not touching the camera. I just locked it because Warren wasn't moving anywhere. So it was recording. I'm just sitting there, and all of a sudden he freaking shoots. And I'm like, "Whoa, what?" <laughs> and Warren's like, "I got him." I'm like, "How did it even get to him?" <laughs> I didn't realize it was that far until I stood up, and I was like, "Oh, it's." And Easton's like, "That's really far." I was like, "No, I don't think it's that far." It well, then the ta- amount of time it took us to get over to him, and I was looking back, I was like, "Yeah, that's it was a fifty or sixty yards, sixty shot. yards, yeah, right." And it was not like a flopping around. He shot him, maybe flopped twice, dead, right there. I was like, "Oh, I could not believe it." I don't that, recommend that people shoot that far with that gun. But 40, we were intentionally 40, 40 doing yards that. and under. It's money. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. peppers the head of a turkey on. It. But like I said, I've shot fours through it. I've shot sixes through it. I've shot combination loads through it. And number fives are what what that gun patterns the best with. And I will. I will tell you though for. If you're using shotguns, uh, whatever it is, 12 gauge, 410, 20 gauge, whatever it is, buy like, I mean, as many boxes as you can find of different varieties of different styles. Because, like, I even went and shot mine yesterday to make sure it's good for, and I'm shooting the same ones he, dad's shooting, the five shots. And me and you had bought four, I think, three, four, and fives last year. Right. And we shot them. And it was kind of cool just to shoot literally same distance, same gun, but swap the shots out and see what. Is holding a better pattern or not? And yours shoots those fives really well. Mine doesn't shoot them for crap. Like I could have a thirty-yard pattern like that with an extra choke on it that is supposed to be tightening the pattern down. But you could put a four in it and it shoots way better. So if I mean, 
as weird as it sounds, don't just pick a shotgun up. It'll work most of the time. But if you want to actually be particular about it, go buy like three or four different. They're not that expensive unless no. you start getting into the soup. Like the TSSs, those those are expensive. But go shoot a couple different kinds through it because each gun's going to take a different different shell. Yeah, and and I would suggest that you use the turkey decoy or not turkey decoys, the turkey targets. Yep. And we cheat. We just make run them, make copies of them on the copy machine rather than I don't need the fancy colors and all that. It's great. There's but actually shooting at a turkey's head will give you, um, you know, a good representation of what that gun is patterning like. But this is the time to be doing that. That's why we're doing this podcast now because this is when you should be breaking that shotgun out because like Easton's talking about. It, I mean, you're going to shoot 15, 10, 15 times, you know, probably to try to get that gun, find out what load shoots the best through it. Yeah. Um, because I have a, a um, Remington 870, and now that gun shoots a 4.6 mix load best. And that, for whatever reason, that's, that's a 12 gauge, too. It's a 12 gauge. And there, I seriously think that, I mean, for the lack of amount of knowledge I have for guns, I don't, it is crazy to me how much a 12 gauge to 20 gauge makes is. Like you would think that, oh, I'll just take the same one in a 12 gauge and a three shot that I would shoot my 20 gauge and it would be remotely close. Not even freaking relatively close. No. Totally different. So you got to do it no matter what it is. But I think that's why it's so hard to find the right ones. It's not like you can just look up, <laughs> I want this pattern. Right. You kind of got to go do it because it, there's so many guns and so many shells and so many chokes and everything else. But that, but that's what I'll, makes it fun. I mean, but people are now reaching out and touching some turkeys. I mean, it's not uncommon to see 50, 60 yard shots. Where when I was growing up, 40 yard shots were a long ways. Um, and but I mean, I can see why people are doing it because when they're practicing and they can show you that these new choke tubes and the and someone has shot their shotgun and got this thing dialed where they're like, watch this, and they're putting 15, 20 pellets in the head of a turkey at 60 yards. You can shoot them that far. Yeah. You I'll know. have to show you. I'm gonna. I'll do a video here soon for on the raised, regular raised hunting channel, and I'll I'll have you bring yours too because I wasn't going to. But I'll I'm gonna go get some shells and just show people that what we're talking about because I'll be able to take I'll be able to take yours and shoot that load and then shoot it out of mine and it, you'll Won't be like what the, the same, heck? Right. And it's the same gauge. They're almost the same gun, just a newer version and a little different model. So, but I'll do a whole video on that too. Cool. Well, I think that's all we should cover today. I think we should leave the tech, the tactics and stuff like that as we start to get a little closer into turkey season. This may create some questions for some people that may start asking, but um, I feel like we've kind of covered the getting ready stuff. And I think we got lots more to talk about when we want to start talking about techniques because you and the reason I didn't pick up on it or didn't say anything about it, but when we start talking about, um, you know, morning setups, afternoon setups, setting up with um, blinds, decoys what are you using and then the big one is reaping turkeys um that's kind of our go-to for the tough turkeys you know and things like that and we've done some stuff to make reaping turkeys a lot of fun yeah so you guys more agree effective with a bow too yeah 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 we want to save some stuff because we're not even there yet all right well thank you guys for tuning in hold today on. hold on i'm gonna introduce that warren's gonna finish this up with his wacky wombat facts i don't know if he's got another wombat deal or not but i have a wacky fact i could say while you're looking at yours well mine are ready but sure you can go mine's not very good i just saw it but it's interesting okay they have historically found a lemur okay lemurs that are That's like a monkey isn't it like from Madagascar. I, oh, I think they're kind of like raccoons. That's the only place you can find them naturally is in Madagascar. Okay. They're Can't not very you. big. They're like, you know, they have historically found one that they can confirm all the DNA and everything is larger than a gorilla. They found a lemur that was freaking bigger than a gorilla. <laughs> Ooh, that would be interesting. Yeah. So, food for thought. You, but he didn't poop cubes, did he? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> The electricity that powers the internet weighs the same as an apricot. I didn't even know electricity could have weight. I have no idea. Well, it's, well, it's matter. A thing. Yeah, yeah, so there's got to be some weight to it. Well, that's Wait, pretty that, that insane make to any think sense that. To me, though. Well, the thing that powers the internet. The electricity that powers the internet weighs the same as an apricot. I think it's saying the that powers like the all of the internet. 
I don't. That's pretty wild to think to try I to need comprehend. more explanation. Yeah, I think that one that was kind of weak. That was dumb. Nowhere close to the wombat. A hip. Well, You're you guys never just like fix stupid that. stuff. A hippo's jaw is wide enough to fit a sports car inside. Okay. What? What yeah. direction? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna assume lengthwise, not horizontally. I wouldn't think. No, lengthwise would be the longest. Yeah, but if you're wide just saying enough. it would go wide enough to do it. No, I don't. I think they're referring to like a sports well, car that's sitting like this. It can go like chunk like that. That's what I would say. There's no way Hippos. it's freaking opening up that long or or that wide. Let's see. A hippo's mouth is usually two feet wide when closed. When open, a hippo's mouth can be four feet wide, which is big enough for a six-year-old child to fit inside. That's concerning they used a six-year-old child. Yeah, I don't know why they chose That's a six-year-old. Example. But it's it's Google's AI, so they're telling us. Uh, Dan. Uh, if it's four feet, then it's got to be like, if the car's sitting like this, it bites it from the side. I don't know. There was one other one here, I think. That kind phone was destroyed, yeah. I mean, it was interesting until now we're getting it. Ugh, I still need a medium button. All right. A medium button. <laughs> You're, you have so many mediocre ones. Wearing headphones for an hour can increase the bacteria in your ear by 700 times. Well, that's not I'll good. I'll bet that drives you nuts. <laughs> Easton's I, a freak about cleaning his ears I am and other weird people's ears. about ears. I have... I have an ear camera, and I have an ear, like the thing you go to the doctor for and, like, wash your ears out. I've got those at home. My ears are very clean, needless to say. He'll come up to you with this thing that's got, like, magnification <laughs> on it and be like, let's see if you got anything in your ears. <laughs> Get away from me, you freaking weirdo. Hey, man, I, I, I wrote that off last year because it helped me with hunting. <laughs> <laughs> what? I couldn't hear. That's why I got it. I you're couldn't saying you'd use it as well. a tax write-off? Heck yeah. You because better hope the IRS is going to say this. <laughs> I wrote it off because it allowed me to hunt better. <laughs> I can't wait to hear that in court. <laughs> well, <Wow>, your honor. <laughs> I needed to clean my ears out so I could hear better, and that pertains to my business. Dude, I had to have <laughs> extended my hearing of deer coming by at least 40 yards. Okay, that is worth it to me. All right. Wow. Sounds like a winner. Is that it for today? Uh, I think so. What was BBD's number, 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 number? Send us your info again at contact at raisedhunting.com. Uh, contact at raisedhunting.com. And then contact at raisedhunting.com. We need your name, address, phone number, and arrows you shoot. We appreciate you. All right. So this is the Raised Hunting crew signing off. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for tuning in today.